A father told me the other day, he says his son comes home very late and he's having a lot of issues with him. But he says, but I'm a good guy, I don't want to fight. So what do I do? When I hear the door, I run up to my bedroom and I lock the door. And that way there's no fighting in the house. He doesn't want to look. If I don't look, I don't get upset. I go to my room, I don't have to be confrontational. But the truth is that this father, although he means well, is making a mistake. Because what his son really needs when he comes home is that his father should look at him, not that his father shouldn't look at him. I understand his father. I'm not judging, trust me. I don't judge. But what his son needs is the father to stay down there and look him in his eyes. The Yeshiva.net. Today's class is dedicated by Gabriella, Shiko, Adin, and Ellen in honor of our grandmother, Avigail. May she live a very long life and be blessed with many beautiful, good, and healthy years. Amen. And also in memory of our beloved grandfather, Leonard, of blessed memory. Thank you so, so much. Today's class is also dedicated to Reb Yaakov ben Reb Asher Tzvi Finkel, known as uh, Jack or Yankel Finkel, of blessed memory, the father of our dear neighbor, Aviva Yurowitz, and the father-in-law of Ephraim Yurowitz, who just passed away uh, two weeks ago, Tehenish Mosei Tzura B'Tzar HaChayim, and may he continue to be an eternal source of blessing, light, inspiration to the family and to all of us and to the entire Jewish people. In honor of uh, Reb Yankel Finkel from Baltimore. You know, everything you purchase in the store or on Amazon comes with a manual. Whether you're buying a washing machine or an iPhone, whether you're buying a game of Monopoly or a flashlight, a vacuum cleaner or a computer, everything comes with a manual. It tells you how to use it, what to be careful of, don't put it on the radiator. Don't let it be exposed to most moisture. Don't put it here. Don't put it there. Don't use this battery. Don't. Everything comes with, with detailed instructions how to use it in a way that will maximize its potential and how not to do anything that will harm it and undermine its usage. The only thing that does not come with a manual is children. Wouldn't it be nice if every child who was born was born with a note? A note, and the note would say, okay, <laughs> with this girl or this boy, you got to be careful. A, B, C, D, E, F. This is what should be done. This is what should not be done. This you need to avoid at all costs. This you should embrace at all costs. No child that I know comes with a manual. We have to figure it out on our own, as we grow, as we develop, and as we make mistakes. And sometimes, by the time we figure it out, it's a little late, as we can hear from the sighs, sighs coming from various people. Torah, Judaism, has a blueprint, a manual, for all of life. In fact, Torah is called Torah Chaim, the Torah of life, living Torah. The Zohar says the reason it's called Torah, the word Torah actually doesn't mean law. It means lesson, instructions. Torah milash naira. Torah begin the airi. Torah is, it's a blueprint, it's lessons. It's not just a book of laws, what to do and what not to do, or a book of history, or a combination of the two. But most importantly, it's a manual. It's a blueprint to navigate the journeys, the voyage, the voyage of life. What about this most important aspect of our voyage, which is raising children, educating children, inspiring children, protecting children, safekeeping children, taking care of children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, disciples, students, as parents, as mentors, as a society, collectively and individually. You look through the Chumash. Is there a blueprint? This is what you do. This is what you don't do. This is what you have to be very careful about. Here you can be lax. Here you should never be lax. We don't find it anywhere explicit. But maybe there is. Maybe there is such a manual. 
Now you say one more thing comes without a manual marriage, right? <laughs> yeah. As I once told somebody, to drive a car, you have to go for training. You need to take lessons. You go for one test, you fail. You go for another driving test and another test, etc. But for raising a child, nobody needs a license. <laughs> For learning how to be a husband or a wife, nobody needs a license. I mean, you need a marriage license if you want to be considered married. But that doesn't require these types of lessons. So, my colleague, Rabbi David Foreman, known as the teacher of Aleph Beta, has suggested very wisely, and it's on this idea that I'm basing today's class, that there is such a manual in Chumash. There is such a manual in Torah. It's a manual so powerful that it's also very precise. You know, whatever you could say in a few words probably can be said. Whatever you can't say in a few words, you probably can't say in a few hours either. Somebody once wrote a letter to a friend. He says, you know, I don't have time, so I'm writing you a long letter. Sometimes the uh, Lincoln's uh, Gettysburg Address was very, very short, but it was enshrined in the immortal memories of the United States of America. So sometimes, the briefest of texts could contain the profoundest and deepest and most timeless lesson, lessons. Huh? Less said, best mended. Yeah, less said, best mended, exactly. And the manual for this is actually subconsciously, instinctively, Jews know that it's a manual because we always say it. And that exists, that's, a, that, that's in Parshish Nasai, in this week's Torah portion, Nasai, which includes the verses known as Birchas Kayan of the priestly blessings. These have become so significant for a few reasons. First of all, the Kayan and the priests were commanded, are commanded, to bless the Jewish people with these blessings. And they did it every single day. And in Eretz Yisrael, they still do it every single day, every single morning, in the middle of the davening, the Kayan and Gab, the front of the shul, and they bless the entire Jewish people and the community and the congregation with these blessings. Outside of there, it's Israel. In most shuls and communities, it's done only on Yom Tif. We just had it on Shavuos. We do it, of course, on Pesach. We do it on Sukkot. We do it Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, only on the holidays, Yom Tovim, when the Kayan and bless the people. It's a strange thing because really the mitzvah is to do it every day. And the question is why in Chutzlar, it's why outside of Eretz Israel, it's not done every day. I should say that in this shul, where we're learning right now, it's actually done every day, <laughs> because there's a Sephardic minion here, and many of the Sephardim have a custom, even outside of Eretz Yisrael, to bless the people every day. So actually this minion, which davens before sunrise, um, they have a blessing every day. <laughs> even in the United States of America, even in Muncie. Many shuls in the Syrian community, in some of the Sephardic communities, they do brichas kainam every single day. There are many homes where the custom is that the parents, the father blesses, the children Friday night, either before Kiddush or after Kiddush, before the beginning of the meal. And how does the father bless the child? With these priestly blessings. Most Jewish communities have a custom that before Yom Kippur, right before Kol Nidre, the father blesses the children. And how does the father bless the child or the mother? With, again, these brachas, brachas kayana. In many communities a custom the parents bless the kala, the bride, or the chasen, the groom, at the badekanesh or before the chuppah, and again with birches kayan and with the priestly blessings. Why these blessings? Because these are the blessings that Hashem chose to tell the kayanim, this is how you should bless the people. So obviously these are the most significant blessings. Now if I ask you a question, if you had an opportunity to bless your child once in your life, what would that blessing look like? What would that blessing consist of? What would you tell your child if I was given an opportunity? Here is your opportunity to bless a child. Sometimes people are given the gift before they pass on to the next world to give a blessing to their children. What are the words that most parents would use at such moments? At such a fateful moment when a person knows that these blessings are the defining blessings, the decisive defining blessings that I can give my child. What would those blessings look like? What would they sound like? What would a person say? Think about it. What would you say at such a moment when you're given this opportunity, once in a lifetime perhaps, to bless your child, 
to bless your grandchild, to bless a child you cherish and love. Well, if Hashem chose these blessings as the defining blessings, they must be the most important things with which we can bless the people, with which we can bless our children. Maybe then this is the ultimate manual and blueprint, how we want to bless our children, not just through words, but through behavior, through action, through our day-to-day life. So let's study these blessings, because at the surface, they seem far from being a manual and a blueprint for raising children. And at the surface, I'm not sure if I would ask somebody, here's your opportunity to bless your child, these are the words we would choose. So Parshas Nasir Perik Dalet Pasuk Chav Beis, that's Numbers chapter 4, verse 22. By Dabur Hashem al Moshe Leimer, Hashem speaks to Moshe saying, Dabur al Aaron al Bon of Leimer, Koy Sevaruch has been Yisrael Amr Lehem. Speak to Aaron and his sons saying, This is how you shall bless the children of Israel, Amr Lehem. Say to them, Yivarechecha adinoi v'yishmerecha, Yoyer adinoi panav elecha v'chuneka, Yisa adinoi panav elecha v'yosem lecha shalom. May God bless you, and watch over you. May God shine His face on you and give you grace. May God lift His face towards you and grant you peace. And I want to ask you a question. Is there a theme that pervades these three blessings? It's three verses, very short. The first verse has three words. The second one has five. The third one has seven. You see that, right? Three words. Five words. The third one has seven words. You know how many letters? Huh? How much is three, five, and seven? What's three, five, and seven? Fifteen, right? Three and five and seven is fifteen. These three verses also have sixty letters. 15 words and 60 letters. How much is 60 and 15? 75. That's the gematria of Koyen. Chaf <laughs> Nun is 75. That's 60 letters plus, huh? very good, right? 15, 15 words, 3, 5, and 7, and 60 letters in these three verses. First one has 15 letters, second one has 20 letters, third has 25 letters, makes up 60 letters, together is the gematria of Kayan because the Kayan and we're empowered to bless the people. But my question is, is there a thematic message that pervades these three blessings? At the surface they seem just disjointed. Does one verse build on the other one? Or is it just disconnected themes? And what's the message? Is it repetitive? Is it different things? First he says, may God bless you. Okay, that's always a good thing. And protect you. That's a good thing. Now comes the second verse. May Hashem shine His face on you and give you grace. That's a whole new blessing. Now we're talking about a face and grace. Vichuneka from the word chen, to give you chen. Like limtzei chen. Beinach. And now the third one is, May Hashem lift His face towards you and grant you peace. You realize in the first one, there's no mention of a face. Hashem should bless you and protect you. The last two do have a mention of a face. Ponov. But differently. In the second one it says, May His face shine towards you. May Hashem shine His face on you. Yo'er Hashem ponov elach. In the third one, it's not may may He shine His face on you. Yisa Hashem ponov. Yisa comes from the word to lift up. It's actually the name of the parasha, Nasei, Nasei Esrash, Su'u Esrash, Lisa, to lift up, may he lift up his face towards you. So face in the last two, but in different context. What is the meaning of that? It's also worth mentioning something I once read, and it's very interesting, that these blessings are the oldest of all biblical texts that have physically survived till today that we have discovered. Meaning, what is the oldest text that we have of the Tanakh? The oldest. They just sold uh, a few weeks ago the Sassoon Codex for $38.1 million. That's the text of a Tanakh, an entire Tanakh that was written approximately 930 after the Common Era, 930. That's more than 1,100 years ago in the area of Syria. 
It was ultimately bought in 1929 by, by David Sassoon from England. That's why it's called the Sassoon Codex. It was sold in 1979 for $300,000, and then a few years later for $3 million, and now for $38 million. A private person, but it was, it was bought for the, an Israeli, for the Israeli Museum. It's going to be displayed in the Israeli Museum. And its value is, because it's more than 1,000 years old, it's one of the oldest texts of Tanakh that we have written by a scribe, and it was written with the Nekudas, which means all the vowels, how to pronounce, and also with the trup, with the musical cantillations. Of course, written in manuscript, and it took probably a year or two years. It's a huge avoida, and uh, it's, it's an incredible, it's an incredible codex. You have a similar one, which is even more famous, known as the Aleppo Codex, Keser Aram Tsova. This was written in Tveria, also in the 900s, Aram ben Asher, and the Rambam used it to uh, write his own Sefer Torah and to outline the exact laws how to write a Sefer Torah. The Rambam is the one who made it so famous, and this was in Aleppo, in Syria, for many years, until 1947, when uh, the UN uh, voted that Israel Jews can have a state. They were rioting in Syria, they torched the shul. They thought it was burnt, but it was actually saved. It came 11 years later to Israel, but 40% of it was stolen. They're still searching for it. There's another codex called the Leningrad Codex, also from the same time, but this is only 1,000 years old. For Jewish history, that's not so long. You know, They once asked a Chinese politician, what's his opinion of the American and French Revolution? He said, it's too early to tell. <laughs> you have to have perspective. So we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls that were discovered in the 1940s in the caves near the Dead Sea, the Qumran Caves, has texts of the Tanakh that were written still from Bayez Sheni, in the middle of the second Beis Amikdash. So you're talking about more than 2,000 years ago. So that was considered the oldest physical text of the Tanakh that we have in our hands, and they were discovered in 1947, and today if you go to the Shrine of the Book in the Israel Museum, it's fascinating, you can actually see them. But there's something much older that was discovered in 1979. Much older from the time of the first Beis HaMikdash. Text of the Tanakh of the time of the first Beis HaMikdash. The story is fascinating because it was in 1979. An archaeologist by the name of Gabriel Barke was examining ancient burial caves at a place called Ketef, Katef Hinom. That's outside of the walls of uh, Jerusalem, if you're familiar with the Menachem Begin Heritage Center. That's the space over there. There was a 13-year-old boy who was assisting Gabriel uh, Barquet in his, in his digs, in his archaeological digs. And this, this boy discovered that beneath the floor of one of the caves, there was a hidden chamber. In one room, they found over a thousand items, hundreds of uh, clay vessels, earthenware vessels that were intact, uh, 40 iron arrowheads that were used in battles in Jerusalem, assumingly, presumably by the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is the one who destroyed the first Beis Hamikdash in the year 586 before the Common Era. They found about 120 silver objects. One day, one of the workers by the name of Judith Halevi, she's now a professor of Bible studies here in America, she pointed out something in the dirt that looked like a cigarette butt. You ever see those cigarette butts outside of show? <laughs> you don't pick them up usually, right? You let somebody else pick them up. It looked like a cigarette butt in a gray-purple color. Then they found, she found another similar object. This time it was the size of a half a cigarette butt, at least a cigarette butt giant. Like, but this was like a half. After sifting and cleaning, it was clear that these were silver scrolls, literally silver scrolls that have been rolled up for centuries, 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 actually for millennia, but they couldn't open them. So they took these uh, silver, what looked like cigarette butts, they were, they were scrolls. <laughs> they were megillas, they were scrolls. And they brought them to the laboratory of uh, the Israeli museum. It took three years for them to figure out a way to open up these cigarette butts, scrolls, without causing damage. And... Uh, after three years, under a microscope, the archaeologist realized what it was. He says, the first words I opened up, he saw Yevarech Hashem. he knew right away that this was Berches Kayanim. 
these were the priestly blessings. And as they began testing it, it turned out that these scrolls were probably used as amulets, like Kameis. People would write on a scroll the verses of Birchus Koyanim from the Chumash from Parshish Nasser. And uh, they had it in a scroll, either the complete blessings or abbreviated version of it. And these were the many scrolls that they found in this cave. They tested them again and again, and they confirmed that they came from the era of the first Beis Hamikdash, because they were dated back to the 6th century before the Common Era. The 6th century before the Common Era, that's the age of Yirmiyahu Hanavi, the waning, the waning days of the, of the first Beis Hamikdash. Only the Dead Sea Scrolls come four centuries later, literally four centuries later. So uh, today, if you go to the Israeli Museum, you could see the oldest texts of, of Tanakh that were ever found were today that I know of is, is, is Birchus Koen of the Priestly Blessing. And by the way, I should just mention it wasn't a small discovery. It was quite important. And the reason is because it created a lot of change in people's thinking, and I'll tell you why very briefly. The scientific community at that time was still under the spell of the German Bible critics. I don't know if you know about the German Bible critics, but way before the Holocaust, a few decades, a whole school of thought rose from Germany where scientists supposedly were proving that the Tanakh is not as old as we think. Most of it was written much, 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 much later, and it has so many different authors based on the different styles and based on the different way the events are described and based on grammar and diction and structure, the whole famous school of thought known as biblical criticism. It came from, uh, it came from Germany. And basically, they wanted to argue that uh, the, most of the Chumash, most of it, if not all of it, was written a thousand years after Moshe Rabbeinu. It was written during the second Beis HaMikdash. Um, one of the most famous uh, German Bible critics was a man named Julius Wellhausen. And he was the father of uh, the documentary hypothesis, as they call it. According to him, Birchus Kayanim, the priestly blessings, of course, date to the era of the second Beis HaMikdash. Suddenly... In 1979, they find the text of these blessings and they're dated hundreds and hundreds of years earlier to the times of Yermia before Nebuchadnezzar, before the Chorban Bayis Rishon. So what happened? Suddenly they realized that this great Bible scholar was selling garbage. And uh, he duped himself or he duped the audience. Everybody was following him in that world, in that culture, scientific world, everybody was following him. But uh, this really refuted and made people rethink. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. <laughs> he wasn't alive any longer. Okay, I'm just mentioning this to bring out the prominence. If it's a Pasuk and Chumash, it can't be more prominent. But nonetheless, it brought out the prominence of these blessings in Jewish life. So, in order to appreciate them, Let's learn a medrash. It's in your second source here, in your source sheets. If you didn't get a source sheet, it's on the bima. Bereshis Rabbah, Mem Gimel Ches. This is a medrash Rabbah, Bereshis chapter 43. Yeah. So what were the purpose of those scrolls? They assume, what I read, they assume that they were kameas, amulets that were made, like, huh? That we don't know. But perhaps people held it in their pockets. I don't know if they had pockets, they had robes, but perhaps people held them in their homes or carried them in their pouch or, uh, or just or around the neck. Uh, like a shmir. It could be that. That's what they assumed because it was a little tiny scroll. It's not like it was used for reading of the Tanakh or learning of the Tanakh. It wasn't of that size and it was just a few psukim. But it's significant that that's the oldest remnant that we have of the written, of written parts of the Tanakh. But that's what they assume it was used for. I don't know that anybody can verify for sure. Probably for protection purposes or zgula or shmira that people want it. <clears throat> Maybe for people to memorize it. So take a look in the Medrash. Meheichan zochu Yisrael From where did the Jewish people merit? Birchis Kayanam. Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Nechemi, 
Of course, there's an argument. How not? Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Nechemia, and the rabbis. Rabbi Yehuda, Amr, may Avram. They merited the priestly blessings from Avram Avinu because it says in Parshas Lech Lech, Avram Avinu didn't think he would have children or Sarah would have children. They were infertile. And Hashem tells him, go outside and count the stars just like you can't count the stars. Ka yi azarecha, thus will be your children. Hence, by Berches Kayanim, it says, Kai Sevarech was Bnei Yisrael. The word Kai and Kai, we have a concept called Gzeir Shava. When we have the same word used in different stories or situations, we compare them to each other, we equate them. Hashem tells Avram, Kai yi azarecha. And how does Berches Kayanim begin? Daber Elan Rabban of Leymar. Kai sevarachu. So the Kai comes from Avram Avinu's Kai. This is Rabbi Yehuda's opinion. Rabbi Nechemia Amar Yitzchak. We merited the priestly blessings from Yitzchak Shenemar. In the story of the Akedah, Avram Avinu takes his son Yitzchak and he says to his other lads who are following him, he tells them, Shvulachem Poyim Achamar, you wait with the donkey, Vani Vahanar, Neilcha Ad Koi. And me and the child, the lad Yitzchak, will go till here. We will bow down, we will prostrate ourselves, and we will return. So at this moment that he said, probably without knowing consciously, we will return, as Rashi points out. The koi that applied to Yitzchak, ani v'anar neilchat koi, this is what generated the koi tzavarach with the birchas koin. Rabban Anami, the third opinion of the rabbis comes, no, it's me Yaakov, Shenemar, koi soimar lebeis Yaakov. In Parshas Yisrael, we just read it on Shavuos, Shem tells Moshe, go teach to the house of Yaakov, the sagid lebnei Yisrael, koi soimar, o kenegdoi koi tzavarach was bnei Yisrael. In tribute of this koi, the Jewish people received koi tzavarach was bnei Yisrael. So we have three perspectives where the Jews merited Birchus Kayanim. What is the meaning of this? At the surface, it just seems like it says Hirkai and Kai, so let's make a cholent and put them together. But obviously, they're saying much more than this. What is the connection between Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, and their three Kais to the Kais of Arachu S. Bnei Yisrael? I mentioned earlier that the three verses are divided by three words, five words, and seven words. Three, five, and seven. Together they have 60 letters. As I said, three, five, and seven is 15, with 60 letters at 75, which is the gematria of Kayan. The fact that it has three verses and each builds on the other, and it's three, five, and seven, obviously is not a coincidence. Obviously that is part of the theme. So the brachas are not just disjointed, nice blessings, or maybe just poetic expressions without much depth. Of course not but rather there is a theme and the theme builds on each other. To show the precision of this, I'm just going to give you one more example. If you take a look at the source sheet again, take a look at the first blessing, for example. Yivarechecha Hashem v'yishmerecha. Right, as I told you, this first one has three words, 15 letters. The second one has five words, 20 letters. The third verse has seven words, 25 letters. Together, 15, 20, and 25 is 60. So it has 60 letters, right, and 15 words. But if you're ready, take the first one, Yivarechecha Hashem v'yishmerecha. This has three words, Yivarechecha Hashem v'yishmerecha. But take a look at the beginning of every word. Yivarechecha begins with a yud. The next word is Hashem, begins with another yud. The next word, v'yishmerecha, begins with a vav. So if you just look at the acronym, you have Yud and Yud and Vav. How much does that make up? 26. Yud is 10. The second Yud is 10. And the Vav is 6. So we have 26. 26, of course, is the numerology of Hashem's name. Yud and He and Vav and He, which is the middle letter. Yivarech Hashem. How much is Yud and He and Vav and He? Yud is 10. He is 5. That's 15. Another 6. 15 and 6 is 21. And 21 and hey is 5, is 26. Hashem's name is 26. So you don't only have Hashem's name in the middle, you have the Yud and the Yud and the Vav is also Yud and Yud and Vav is 26. Now if you take a look at the first Pasuk again, you have three words and you have 15 letters. Yud, Vez, Reish, Chav, Chav, 15 letters. What's the numerology of 15? Yud and hey is 15. That's again Hashem's name, Yud, Ka. 
which is the first two letters of Hashem's name, Yudke Vavke, but it's also a name in and of itself, Yudke, is Hashem's name, Ki Yod Al Kes Yudke, Ki Bika Hashem Tzurei Lam, Yudke, and that is 15, right? So you have that right away in the number of the letters. Now, if you take Yud and He, take Yud and He, so it's a Yud and a He, but how do you spell them out? If I want to write out Yud and He, right? So follow me. Yud is Yud, Yud Vav Dalet, right? Yud, Yud Vav Dalet, and He is He Aleph. So now let's think about that. Yud, so Yud is 10, Vav is 6, Dalet is 4, so that's 20. He is 5, Aleph is 1, so 26. <laughs> so you have again, Yud, He, when spelled out, you come back to 26. So if even the letters here and the acronym, and it's true in the whole title, but including in these blessings, are so accurate, and this is true with every one of these three verses, certainly we can appreciate that these are not just, you know, nice brachas, why not? He should protect you, he should bless you, he should look at you, he should shine his face, give you grace, uh, lift up his face, give you peace, which are all nice stuff. But there's actually a very profound and meaningful blueprint here for life, for parenting, and for pedagogy. And because, because the Jewish people knew this instinctively and subconsciously, and also consciously, therefore it became the standard text for blessing a child. As I said, Ad Hayoyim, till today, this became the standard way of blessing a child. Before I get into the actual details, I'll just share with you what I heard from one of the survivors many years ago. Erev Yom Kippur, 1945, who was getting close to the end of 1945. The war ended in May 1945. A few months later, of course, was Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So this was a few months after the war, was Second World War was over. The Kleisenberger Rebbe, Rabbi Yekusil Yehuda Halberstam, who passed away in uh, July 1994, Tammuz Tavshinun he lost a wife and 11 children in the Holocaust. Ten of them were murdered in Auschwitz with his wife, Hannah. The 11th survived and died in the DP camps, but the Kleisberger Rebbe never knew that he survived. He was sick and he died right after the war. So he was then... In a, in a DP camp, you know, the survivors were placed in DP camps. DP stands for Displaced Person Camps. They were, most of them were in Germany or around Germany. And he was in one of those camps and he was preparing himself for Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year. Suddenly there was a knock on the door and a young girl came in and she said, Rebbe, I don't have a father anymore and I don't have a, no a mother anymore. Nobody is going to be able to bless me before Yom Kippur, I want a blessing. Because the bracha of children today, many kahilas have the minik to do it, as I said, every Friday evening. But many didn't do it every Friday evening. But before Yom Kippur, everybody blessed their children, most communities. So this girl, who was obviously orphaned, came to the Kloisenberger Rebbe saying, I don't have anybody to bless me. So he put his hands over her head, and he blessed her the way a father blesses his daughter on the eve of Yom Kippur, and with tears in his eyes, he told her how precious she was, what a gift she was, and how he was praying for her bright and beautiful future. And he blessed her with the traditional Birchus Kayanim and the traditional addition that fathers say to their daughters. She left, she was satisfied. A few minutes later, there's another knock on his door, another girl. <laughs> And the other girl, again, was without a father, and she wanted to be blessed before Yom Kippur. It was right before Yom Kippur. So the Kleisenberger Rebbe, again, he summoned her in, and he blessed her with the same routine. He put his hands over her head, and he blessed her with Berchus Kayanim, the way a father blesses a daughter. This repeated itself again and again and again. Orphans kept on coming in, and he attended to each of them as though he was their father. And they say that that year of Yom Kippur, he blessed over 80 children. Over 80 children who were orphaned, but they survived, came for a blessing. And when fathers and mothers bless their children with these blessings, they feel the profundity of it. 
but we don't always, we can't always articulate in words the profundity of it, the depth of emotion, which doesn't matter because words are anyway limiting and never really articulate and define the true depth of something. But yet, as we really study these words, we can discover not just an emotional outburst of love, which is in itself quite potent and powerful, but also a, 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 a guide, Judaism's uh, guiding blueprint for pedagogy, for parenting. And we have a three, if I could call it this way, a three-step program for love. The first words, the first pasuk is Yivarechecha, Adinoi v'yishmerecha. Literally, we translate it as may Hashem bless you and protect you. V'yishmerecha comes from the word shamer, which means watch over you. What does this mean? What does this mean? Another very interesting thing I wanted to mention. Before we do a mitzvah, we have a blessing. Before the kayan and bless the people, they also say a bracha. What's their bracha? Even though it's unique, because usually most mitzvahs are not blessings. Right? Most mitzvahs, before I put on tefillin, I make a blessing. Before you light Shabbos candles, you make a blessing. Before you separate chali, you make a blessing. Here the mitzvah is to say a blessing. <laughs> and yet before they say a blessing, you also have to say a blessing. You have to prepare to say a bracha. They can't just go, on and bl- go up and bless. What's the blessing? Hashem sanctified us with the Gdusha, with the sanctity of Aaron, and He commanded us to bless the Jewish people with love. Now, this is very unique because. Whenever we make a bracha to appear for a mitzvah, we never put in the word ba'ahava with love. For example, you don't say, Of course it's good to light candles with love and zest and passion. Or or any other bracha. Not that a mitzvah shouldn't be done with love. Every mitzvah should be done with love. But it's usually not specified in the blessing of the mitzvah. Here it is. With love. Why? The Zayar says, and it's brought in Allah, that a Kayan who hates anybody in the crowd should not go up to bless the people. He has to be very careful. If he has resentment, hate to a person in the audience, he should not go up to do Berchus Kayanim. In other words, Ba'ava is a very important qualification. You have to love the people in order to bless them. Don't bless if you, if you can't, you can't. So that's very interesting, but why does, it make it, why, why does it make its way into the blessing, into the bracha? The Balatanya once said something fascinating. He said we have to understand it a little differently. He commanded us to bless the Jewish people with the gift of love. That's the bracha. I'm giving them, it's not, that is what we're blessing them. We're blessing, we're giving them the gift of love. But the question is, that's not what it is. We're not speaking about love. We speak about Yivarech HaShem V'Yishmarech We don't say you should be able to love, you should find love, you should give love, you should have love, you should experience love, you should bequeath love. It's a beautiful blessing. But the word Ava is not mentioned here. At the surface. <laughs> but if we, if we excavate, I spoke before about an archaeological excavation. If we excavate the meaning of these words, We'll understand why the Chazal and Masech to put in that word Ba'ava, because really this is a blueprint of what love looks like. What does love look like? We say, well, love doesn't have a shape, it doesn't have a color. If you're going to start telling me the color of love, what type of love is it? Love is an emotion. Love is passion. Love is life. It says, Shleim uh, says, Aza Kamavis Ava. Love can be as powerful as death and jealousy can be as... Harsh as the abyss, kasha kashal sina. Does love have a color? Does love have a shape? Does love have a moment? <clears throat> but the truth is that authentic love has an expression. We all understand that. And how it expresses itself in a way that is not just my own expression based on the moment, but an expression that really helps build a person. 
and benefit a person, that is exactly what Birchus Kayanim comes to teach us. Or in other words, a blueprint for raising children. So when we are, when we do, we, we, we do have children, the Torah does give us a manual and says, this is how God blesses you. This is how he wants the Kayanim to bless you. This is how you want to bless your children because these are the blessings that we want to give our children, not just through words, but through life. What does the word Yivarechecha mean? The word Yivarechecha is a very known word. It comes from the word Bracha, which means a blessing. But what does the word Bracha really mean? In Lashen Kaidish, it's not such a clear word. The word Bracha actually needs explanation. What do you say? Huh? So Breich is a pool, right? Breich is a pool. That's one meaning of it. So what would be the connection to a blessing? So generally... In, in, in Hebrew, in Lashen Kodesh, bracha has two meanings. The first meaning of bracha is to, uh, to increase and grow something. For example, in Parshish Mishpatim, it says, He will bless your bread and water, which means you're going to have an abundance of grain, an abundance of food, an abundance of water. Uh, it says by Yitzchak, and Parshish told us, he planted his farms, Hashem, and God blessed him, and the earth produced a disproportionate amount of grain that grew to the point that the Philistine king got jealous of Yitzchak's abundance and Yitzchak's prosperity and wealth, etc. So the first meaning of bracha is for something, not just to exist, but to, uh, uh, what they say, uh, 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 the gift that keeps on giving. It continues to grow, it continues to increase. That's one element of bracha. But a bracha also has another meaning. And that is to actualize a latent potential. To draw out something that may be hidden. And the bracha is the ability to be able to express it. To actualize potential. That's why in Hebrew a pool is called a brecha. What does a brecha mean? It draws forth water from a pre-existing. I can't go swimming in my sink. Or my hose, Right? But the pool gets filled up from a source of water, whatever that source of water is. Whether it's a spring, whether it's a hose in our days, but the pool accesses from a source of water and now fills it up and now people can go bathe or enjoy a nice swim in a hot summer day. That's brecha. In Mishnayis, in Kilayim, chapter 7, we have an expression, hamavrich es hagefen. Hamavrich es hagefen means if you have a vine and you take a branch and you bend it, into the earth, you bend it into the earth, and you bring it up elsewhere. So you're creating a new sapling, a new tree. So mavrich, as hagefen, means you bend, you take the vine, you bend it, right? And you create a new source of it that comes from the first tree. And now there's a new growth that grows elsewhere. That's called mavrich. You have in Parshas uh, Chaye Sara, uh, Eliezer goes to look for a shidduch for Yitzchak, and he comes with camels. It says, vayavrich, Es hagmalim. What does vayavrech es hagmalim mean? He made the camels kneel down. You know, you ever took a camel ride? Huh? Exactly. Camels are very, very tall. How are they going to drink from a trough? So vayavrech, the camels kneel down, they come down, and now they can drink. It comes from the word berech. What's berech in Hebrew? Or berechayim? Knees. What's the function of a knee? The knee allows me to bend to squat, to go down. Chas v'shalom, without the knee, the person can't do that. So essentially, it's a form of stretching, of, of coming down. So when you say you bless somebody, what does it mean? It means there may be something that's concealed, but it has to be brought down. It has to be brought out. It shouldn't just remain in the source where the tree is. I want to continue the branch and bring it elsewhere. So it's actualizing potential, it's bringing out something from, from an inner source and maybe a dormant source to be able to come out. That's, by the way, the meaning we speak about the fact that uh, we speak about the fact that uh, you bless Hashem, Baruch Hashem. What does it mean to give Hashem a blessing? <laughs> what does it mean to give Him a blessing? Why does He need my blessing? What's my blessing going to do? Gemara says, Hashem tells you, Shmuel, you sh- the Kohen Godly Yom Kippur, Yishmol Bni Barcheni. If you know Avram Fried's song, right? 
Yishmael, bless me. What does it mean? Baruch Sha'amar Vaya Olam. Baruch Hatashem. What does it really mean to bless? The answer is Baruch from the word Berech, Ani. Hashem's presence can be concealed, can be latent, can be dormant, not visible. So bracha is to bring it out. The human being actualizes the divine love, the divine light in their life or in their environment or in their world. So this is the two meanings of bracha. The first thing we tell the child, the first blessing that the kayan gives the Jew is, Yivarechecha Hashem v'yishmerecha. What's the first function of a parent? To bless my child. I don't only mean to bless verbally, avada, that's of course a wonderful thing, but the whole concept of bracha, yivarechecha, to be able to bless my child, or to be a conduit for God's blessing to my child. Meaning, I want to, first thing, strengthen, grow, multiply his or her strengths, build them up in all ways, physically, emotionally, Socially, academically, psychologically, spiritually. They should be blessed. This is the first and fundamental obligation of parenthood. To build up a child's physical strength by nurturing them, by feeding them. Build up their emotional strength by giving them love, resilience, fortitude, and providing their needs. Building up their intellectual strengths through education. Now Mark Twain once said, I never allowed my schooling to interfere with my education. That's Mark Twain. But each person according to what works for them and each child according to his or her capacity, building up their moral strength by helping them to discern right from wrong, truth from falsehood, rubbish from authenticity, superficiality from depth, pettiness from largeness, emes from sheker, That's how you build up their moral strength and to build their own power to provide one day for their own families, for their own children, for their own students by giving them the tools to succeed. So that's the first fundamental obligation of parenting, yivarechecha. But yivarechecha doesn't only mean that you should be able to grow. So when I feed a child, a child is nursing from a mother, that allows their physical strength to grow, the body to be nurtured and grow. That's brach in the most pragmatic, practical sense. And then there's the emotional, building up their emotional strength, their moral strength, their educational strength, etc. But brach also means to bring out. Huh? Oh, yeah. Exactly. Bracha also is the ability to bend down. <laughs> a mother does that, right? And a father also has to do that. To really help my child actualize their potential. Mavrich es hagefen, vayavrich es hagmalim. Bring out what may be there in a latent way that it should be actualized. So from a place of potentiality, I want to draw the blessing into reality. Every child is full of potential pregnant with tremendous power and creativity and resources. And I want to help my child discover his or her power, discover his or her virtue, discover his or her talents, gifts, resources, helping them become a source of light and blessing for themselves and others. So that's the first element, Yivarechech HaHashem. May God help that you should, may God be able to bless you. May you experience this type of growth and development and actualizing of potential in a way that helps this person become a blessing. And one day they can continue that blessing to a new generation, to the next generation, to continue that chain. As you mentioned well, the word bracha comes from the word berech, which is the knee bending. Because whenever I want to actualize your potential, I have to ask not what you can do for me, but what I can do for you. Your potential may not be my potential. Your vocation may not be mine. Your dream, your personality, your soul is unique. So sometimes I have to really be able to help my child see what they're good at, not what I think they're good at or what I am good at or what I want them to be good at. 
When Avram Avinu, where does the word Vayavrich first happen? When Eliezer goes to look for a Shidduch for Rivka. If Avram wanted a Shidduch for Yitzchak, Avram at that time was an El Yid, pretty wise man to put it mildly. Go find a Shidduch for Yitzchak. No, he calls in Eliezer and makes him swear with conditions. The answer is Avram knew that the match for Yitzchak cannot be the one that Avram would choose for himself. Avram was Midas HaChesed. Avram was the attribute of love. He needed a Sarah who was a counterbalance to Avram Avinu. Yitzchak was the attribute of Gvura. So Yitzchak needed actually as his soulmate Rivka. So Avram Avinu knew if he goes to choose a wife for Rivka, it may be a good person for himself, not for Yitzchak. So he took Eliezer. Eliezer had a very interesting identity. On one hand, he was objective. On the other hand, he grew up in the house. So he knew Yitzchak through and through, but he wasn't a father. Sometimes when parents choose Shaduchim for children, it's with the best intentions, but it's sometimes with the best intentions what's good for them, not necessarily what's good for the child. Sometimes it's painful for a father and a mother to say, my child is not me. So Avram Avinu understood that, and that's where the first time Vayavrech is mentioned. It's not a coincidence. In Torah, everything is precise. The camels kneeled. To really be a blessing to somebody else, I sometimes have to be able to bend, to kneel, to be able to tune in to what is your potential, to be able to help you grow based on your needs. So that's the first element, Yivarecha Hashem. But then it continues, V'yishmerecha. And He shall protect you. God is the ultimate parent. God is our father, God is our mother. He's the father and mother of creation and the father and mother of each and every one of us. When he identifies to Moshe his role to redeem the Jewish people from Parai's slavery, he identifies the Jewish people as Bni Bechari Yisrael. Go tell Parai, you are enslaving my child. Bni Bechari Yisrael. Those are Moshe's words to Parai. You're enslaving God's child. Later he would say, Bonim Atem Lashem Alekechem. Bonayhem. A child. So the way God blesses us is the way he's teaching us how we must bless our children. Of course we use Birchus Kainim as a text of blessing. If this is how the cosmic father and mother chose to bless, obviously this is the blessing. So that's why we choose to bless. So whatever it says about Hashem doing for us, this is a paradigm. Like the Pasuk says, Ladafka, but you should cleave to him. So Chazal say, how do you cleave to the Shekhinah? He davig bidrachav. You emulate the paradigms, the ways, the pathways. So Birchus Kayanim is the greatest vekus. What, what does a father and mother do for a child? Yevarech Hashem. That's what I want to do. And then there's V'yishmerecha. V'yishmerecha means bless you, but protect you. Blessing is all in the positive. I build your strength. I have a child, a fetus, a baby was born. Now I want to develop this child. Physically, emotionally, psychologically, morally, spiritually, as we said. I want to actualize the potential in the child. But there's something else. We live in a dangerous world. A child needs protection. I could try, I could invest everything in building your potential, but then somebody comes from the outside or from the inside and hurts this child physically, emotionally, intimately, etc., etc., and all the potential is squandered, it's destroyed because the child now puts in his or her soul a big question mark. Do I even have a right to exist? So Yivarecha Hashem comes with a condition. V'yishmerecha. Just like we spoke in the previous class, all of Judaism is divided. There's mitzvahs essay, there's mitzvahs loisus. There's what I do, but there's also what I don't do. And that's equally important. Because there's no yes without no. There's no relationship without boundaries. If everything goes into my system, if I don't know how to say no, I don't know how to say yes. Like we spoke in the story of Hillel and Shammai. Right? Shammai pushed him away. Hillel embraced him. Shammai wasn't throwing away a person. Shammai was teaching him, if you want to understand Torah, you have to learn how to sometimes say, no, this conversation is not for me. This relationship is not for me. This behavior is not for me. This place is not for me. Not because you don't love, but because you love. But because you love. Because you respect. Just like a person who respects themselves. There's certain things I won't eat. Many years ago I was once eating, and my eating habits are not the best, let's put it that way. So my wife was watching me finish off the plate. So she said, I wish you would respect your body more than you respect the garbage can. 
I'm like, what are you talking about? She says, why, don't you, why, why, why are you eating this food? Why don't you get rid of it? I said, it's a pity. Throw it in the garbage. So she says, ah, really it belongs in the garbage. Instead of putting it in the garbage, you're putting it into your body. <laughs> you should respect your body a little more than you respect the garbage. A lot of people, food belongs, this food belongs in the garbage. <laughs> Where do they put it instead? <laughs> in their sacred body. So Yivarechecha always comes with Yivishmerecha. A child must have safety, must have protection. Of course, first and foremost, protection from any harm that may come into their way, Khalila. From every form of violation of boundaries that may compromise their health, their safety, their emotional dignity. That's part of Yishmerecha. There's also Yishmerecha. Protect the child from him or her themselves. <laughs> we each have within ourselves elements that can be self-destructive. That's essentially the rationale and the justification for discipline. What's discipline really about? It's v'yishmerecha. If it's not about v'yishmerecha, then there's no justification for it. If I'm disciplining a child because I'm angry, or I'm impulsive, or i got nothing better to do, or I'm going to show you who's boss and who's right, because I'm having a bad day, and I have a headache, and I have the flu, and I'm not in the mood, which are all normal experiences. But if that's where the discipline is coming from, then it's, there's no justification for it. In fact, it could be harmful, it could be counterproductive, and sometimes it can be, even be damaging. Chas v'shalom. Discipline always has to come from a place of, Yivarechecha Hashem v'yishmerecha. It's about safety, it's about protection. A child who's allowed to eat everything will harm himself. A child who has no responsibilities will grow up incapable. A child who has no bedtime <laughs> and an adult who has no bedtime will not be able to function well. Even adults, maybe more than children. <laughs> children could sometimes get away with a couple of hours. Adults, oy vey. A child who's allowed endless hours of screen time might become addicted, might become socially inept, and it may dull their intellectual and social abilities. A child who never heard the word no might grow up selfish and spoiled. So if I'm a responsible parent, I need to provide my child with safety and protection from their own inner instincts that may be counterproductive. Never out of anger, but out of the need of yivarechecha, so that you should be able to grow, that you should be able to prosper, you should be able to maximize your potential. That's why Yivarecha Hashem V'Yishmerecha is always one sentence. One, it's one sentence. It's one verse. We all have instincts, appetites, behaviors when they're not under control, when they're not protected. Can harm us. We call it the Yet Sahara, the negative toxic inclinations, whatever they look like. And I need to protect myself from that. Those are the boundaries we need for Shmira. That is an essential element of education. They call it vitamin N. No. It's a vitamin. There's vitamin D, Gavaldic. Vitamin D, God now gives us in abundance. You don't have to take, buy it from the store to sit in the sun. There's vitamin Y. It's called yes. Of course. There's also vitamin N. If that's the only vitamin I'm giving, nishgit, there should be some other vitamins, some other supplements. But part of a yishmerecha is N. But always an uh, N that's coming from yishmerecha, from protection, from caring, from attachment, from connection, not from apathy or, or, or I'm not in the mood or I'm angry. And if I am angry and I'm impulsive, gesunta hate. Go listen to a Rabbi Waiwai class, but don't let it out on the child or do something else. Exercise, whatever. Of course, the Yishmerecha becomes extremely essential when we're dealing with an outside world. Sometimes, and this is important, a child is suffering in school. It used to be the school was always right. <laughs> I had classmates, <laughs> they told me, I mean, when we were growing up, this is this 1970s, if they were smacked in school and their father would find out, what would he do? Smack them again. If you were expelled from school, it means you were much worse than anybody imagined, so the penalty had to be much worse. 
The point is, one has to be extremely sensitive because when a child is in a school, you don't want them to lose respect for teachers and for principals. It's not healthy. It's not productive. Shabbos tables where people sit bashing the system and bashing schools that you're putting your children through. It's not fear to them. It's simply not fear. One always has to have a sensitivity and an awareness what is good for the child. But on the other hand, sometimes if a child is suffering in a difficult place and the people that are dealing with it don't know what to do or they're clueless or they may be harmful, the obligation is v'yishmerecha. I need to protect people from long-term and short-term trauma which may affect them in a very, very profound way. When does this Hashem begin? When does this process of blessing our children with this first blessing, when does it actually begin? The first step of the parenting manual. And the answer is, it doesn't begin after birth. It begins at the moment of conception. That's when Yevarech Hashem Yishmerecha begins. It continues through all the formative years of a child and beyond. But it begins with conception. Indeed, if you look at it biologically, scientifically, and spiritually, this is what a mother's womb does. The Maral says, the word for womb is rechem. Kadesh li kol b'cher, peter kol rechem. Yes, it comes from the word rachem, which means compassion. Rachemim. Why is a rechem called rachemim? The answer, of course, is, everybody probably in this room can guess it much faster than I can, huh? The womb contains. What does it contain? It will contain the fetus, the embryo and the fetus. What will allow, what will allow it to do? Just grow, just develop. Develop based on how it's supposed to develop, based on its own genetic makeup and based on its own gift. So... The fundamental job of a womb is essentially to bless. That's what it does. To increase and grow the child from egg to embryo to fetus and to actualize all the latent potential in the seed and in the egg. What if we wouldn't have the rechem? What would happen? Nothing can happen. I have the cell and the sperm and the egg. Very nice. (laughs) But what what are you going to do with that? It's only the rechem of mom that blesses it, that brings it out. That's mavrich hagefen. And I'm not going to describe to the audience sitting here how much bending and sacrifice pregnancy takes. A mother eating and living with another child, with another creation, sometimes more than one, in her womb, blessing it. But it's all about growing it and bringing out its potential. So the womb's function is really to bless the fetus, in both interpretations of the word blessing, the womb blesses it, grows it, and brings out its potential. The womb does something else also. V'yishmerecha. It protects it. It protects the fetus. It pr- creates a pristine environment. A safe place in which a baby can grow. That's why today we know that traumas that pregnant women go through while they're carrying the baby can have a deep impact on the child because the child's safe environment is in the mother. So a mother's moods and attitudes and perspectives and experiences, even when they're carrying the child, has a profound impact. There was a whole study done in England about music. You know the study? Pregnant women who were listening to music and how the children, after they were born, how they responded to that music. It's incredible. Or as the Gemara puts it, in Nida, that in the womb the child learns the whole Torah. Which means our deepest messages about life we absorb during those nine months even if it remains in the unconscious layers of our psyche. And that's the word rechem, which means the compassion. What does it mean to have compassion towards somebody? What does it really mean? It means to nurture them, to contain them, to make space for them. Isn't that what a womb does? It makes space for them. It helps them grow and it keeps them safe. People can grow without safety. Yivarechecha Hashem v'yishmerecha. We now come to the second stage. Yoir adinoi pana velecha vichuneka. What is this? I want to mention one detail. I just the word berech, barech is beis reish chaf. 
Do you see the commonality in all these three letters? What's the second letter of the Aleph Bez? Bez. All twos. In the tens, the first one is Yud. Ten, what's the second letter after Yud? Chaf. Twenty. When you go to the hundreds, the Kuf is a hundred. What's the one after that? Resh, two hundred. Beirech is two, two hundred twenty. Why? Why is it all twos? Brach, it's all twos. You're always dealing with the twos. Huh? Multiplying. Because since bracha is to multiply, to grow, so from one you create two. And then from two you multiply more and more and more and more. Oh, so you're bringing it from the one into the two. One is the source. Two is duality. Two is the manifestation. Everything is one in the source, but it could be concealed. It's all submerged in the singular source. And then two means you bring it out from the source, and now suddenly it has different forms. There is duality, there's different dimensions, different perspectives. So from the same source, you have so many different elements. What does it say on the American dollar? U pluribus unum, ah? E pluribus unum. From many, one. From the twos, you go back to one. That's why it says, Kadesh li kol pchoyr. What's pchoyr? Pchoyr is the same word. Beis chaf resh. Right? Because the pchoyr is already the one who comes out of the parent's unit. It's the child who comes out. So Kadesh li kol pchoyr. Sanctify the pchoyr. Hashem says, take the dualities of the world and bring it back to the one. Everything came from his word. So now you're taking the bracha, like we said before, you bless Hashem, meaning you reveal the oneness in the duality. We now come to the second one. May God shine his face upon you and give you grace. As we emulate Hashem, what's the second stage in parenting? To shine your face on your child and give her or him grace. There's a beautiful Rashi on these words. Rashi says, what does it mean, Yoy Rashem Panav Eilecha? I quote, Yare Lecha Panim Shoychakais, Panim Tzuhuvais. May he show you a smiling, bright, and radiant countenance. Yoy Rashem. Hashem should shine his face. What does it mean he should shine his face? Rashi says, he should smile at you. He should show you the beauty, the, 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 the joy, the quelling, the radiance in his face. Vichuneka from the word chen, give you chen. This is the second stanza of the blessing of the Kayanim to the Jewish people because it's the second step in the manual for parenting and pedagogy. What is it? It almost sounds simple, and it is, but it's also very profound, like all simple things. And that is the blessing and gifts parents can give their children, teachers can give disciples, grandparents can give grandchildren, we can all give each other is smile at them. Enjoy them. Yoyer panave lecha. Kvel in their presence. Make sure that they feel seen and appreciated for who they are. You want your child to feel that his or her very existence brightens up your life and makes you smile. When a child feels and senses and knows that when he or she walks into the room, and father's face lights up, or mother's face lights up, or Bubby's face lights up, or Zadie's face lights up, organically, instinctively, from a very deep place. It makes all the difference. And that's why we have here the word vichuneka. What does vichuneka mean? Let him grant you grace. What does grace mean? Grace is one of those words people use. What does it really mean? This person has grace. Can anybody tell me what grace means? This person has chain. May you have chain. Vichuneka. He should give you chain. What does it mean to have grace? <laughs> it's a very relative word, right? The word chain is the beginning of the, another word in Lashon Kaidish, chinam. Chinam. What does chinam mean? For free. For free. Rashi says in Dvarim, in Peri Gimel, Whenever you see the word chanon, ve'eschanon, ve'eschanon, Rashi says, whenever it says ve'eschanon, it's matnas chinam. What does matnas chinam mean? A free gift. Ve'eschanon is, I'm asking for your chen, I'm not asking to pay my wage. I'm asking you for a free gift, matnas chinam. That's why chen and chinam are closely associated to each other. 
What's vichuneka? The Kayanim are blessing us. Nesiyas chayin is to be able to experience that, to be able to be noise chayin be'eni elikim v'adam. Chanina too? What's chanina? When you go to the president of the country and yes, there's a person in prison, he has a sentence for 27 years, yeah, and the president gave him a chanina. Maza chanina? Huh? Pardoning. In that case, I'm not sure it was a matnas chinam. It probably wasn't. But in other cases, call it a matnas chinam. Whatever, we're not going to get into that. But you get the point. What's the gift of vichuneka that I can give my child? It's the gift of matnas chinam means undeserving love. Not love that I pay for. Or as we call it today, unconditional love. What do I mean? There is love and compassion I give my child which, which are utilitarian. They're purposeful. They have a goal. And a good goal. A productive goal. I'm trying to build up my child. I'm trying to turn my child into a mensch. I'm trying to turn my child into a success story. I'm trying to turn my child into a happy, resilient, emotionally stable, caring, kind, good human being. I discern potential and I try to cultivate it. I sometimes see somebody with potential. Yeah, I will show them love and compassion and put an energy to them. And it's not chinam. I want to see potential. It's a beautiful thing, actually. People who invest time and resources in another person, let's say a student, whom they see their glory, they see their, their gift, and I want to help you cultivate it. And love is an essential way believing in somebody and helping somebody to cultivate their potential. I want you to be able to have a great and rewarding life physically and spiritually. Theoretically, before we vichuneka, theoretically, and I say this theoretically, you could say it another ten times for me. If a, somebody would see that a child has absolutely no potential, it doesn't exist, but theoretically, then there would be no room for this type of chen, for this type of compassion. Bracha the word, we, the word we use in the first stanza, and we don't repeat that word, is underscores the awareness of potential and the focus on potential. That's what bracha is. And exactly in this way, the womb functions. How does the womb function? A womb is very discerning about the nurture and compassion it bestows. A womb doesn't bestow Rachmanes on anybody or anything. The womb has to discern what? Potential. What happens when a womb discerns that there's no potential? The womb expels. It's Rechem. But I have to be able to see that this nine months of labor are going to produce potential. If the womb discerns that there's no potential here, the womb says, okay, I did what I have to do. The body has to protect itself too, and I have to get ready for something else. In other words, it grows the fetus, it protects the fetus, if it perceives potential. If not, it will miscarry the fetus. It will eject it at whatever stage it makes that discernment. So the love in the womb is potential-based. It needs to see results. And that's how the Rechem could survive. If the Rechem wouldn't do this, what would happen? It wouldn't be able to survive. The mother would not be able to be a mother. That's the first step of parenting. I protect you because I want to see you safe. I want to make you, I want you to grow. I feed you, I nurture you, I educate you, whatever it is, all in order to help your potential come out. I want to, a parent wants to see something happen with their child. That's part of love. I don't want you to be a couch potato. I don't want you to feel that you have to sleep till 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I don't want you to feel that you're a loser and a burden to society. I want you to feel that you're a gift. I want you to feel your light, your power, your beauty. I want to see you grow into a functional, fine human being. That's step one, but now there's step two. It's a second verse because it's a second step. And the second step is vichuneka. May you experience grace from God. And if God wants to give that to you, that's what a parent does. May I be able to give a mat chinam, the gift of unconditional love. It's love that has no goal. 
The love of the womb has a goal. The love of Yerech has a goal, and it's a good goal, and it's a beautiful goal, and it's a responsible goal, and it's a holy goal. But then there's another element of love, and that is unconditional love. What does unconditional love mean? Unconditional love means I can't help but smile when I see you. <laughs> Sorry. It comes without strings attached. There's something about this soul that just makes me smile. Just like when a mother holds her one-week-old baby or a father holds his two-month-old baby and you're cuddling your baby in the arms and singing a beautiful Yiddish lullaby, Afim Pripichik, Brenta Fayetol. Does anybody still do that? Yeah? Kamech Alefa. Or kissing the baby, singing to the baby, looking at the baby. And no healthy father or mother looks into the child's eyes and say, you know what's so cute about you? One day you're going to be <laughs> a big doctor <laughs> or a lawyer or a president or a baltzak or the big Talmud Chach or whatever it is. That's not what's happening. Then they used to say a joke, right, that Jewish mothers were arguing, when is a baby viable and you're not allowed to abort anymore? One is they called viable. One is they graduates medical school, the other one law school. There's a joke about this restaurant, right? So a guest come in, so the mother says, here are the two kids, six and seven. He's a doctor, he's a lawyer. But that's not what's happening. Why are you enamored by the face of this child? You're so cute. You're a what are you really seeing? What you're seeing at that moment is a chelik elekam imal. That's what you're seeing. And you're really seeing that. So now I ask you a question. When they're 14, they're not a chelik elekam imal anymore. <laughs> huh? It's not, it's not. This is so important. That's the vichuneka. It's the love that when my eyes meet the eyes of my child, there is a recognition, there's a sense of intimacy that cannot be replaced or substituted by anything or anybody else. And it's a gift. It's a gift. And I should say we live in a world where many people have not received this. Because if I'm in a place of active trauma and brokenness and I haven't received it, how do I even know to give it to somebody else? If I'm not blessed, how do I bless somebody else? That's why by Birchis Kayanim it says, Hashem says, I'm going to bless the Kayanim. Why is that important? Because only if you feel blessed can you bless others. So Hashem says, I'm going to bless the Kayanim. Don't worry. You'll be able to pass on this blessing because I'm giving this blessing to you. So when we talk here about parenting, it's also parenting ourselves. Kabed, I was once talking to a bunch of men. I said, Kabed savicha ve'asimecha doesn't only mean respect your father and mother. Of course it means that. It also means something else. Respect your fatherhood and motherhood. Respect yourself as a father. Respect yourself as a mother. I told a bunch of men, I said, you're not 11 years old anymore. I know you feel like 11. You want to act like 11. You sometimes do. Respect the father inside of you. Respect the mother inside of you. But I could only do that if I could respect a child inside of me. If I was never a child, how do I become an adult? You don't, the womb never tells the fetus, the, the embryo, come on, I don't have time, what's so? I already prepared Vachnacht and a bris. I already made reservations for your bar mitzvah. I already rented the hall and I have the atrium for the chasen. I don't have time, nine months, 20 years. You know what, the embryo is not going to look, <laughs> it's not going to get very excited. You want me to become an adult? I have to be an embryo, I have to be a fetus. This is the first trimester, there's a process. Be'ezer Hashem, B'Shal Tev Motzlachas, there'll be birth, and then there's growth, and everybody understands that. Suddenly we become adults, there's no process anymore. If I couldn't have been an embryo and a fetus and a child, how do I know how to be a father and a mother? That's why David HaMelech says he had to learn it himself. Those who were blessed to receive this in a very revealed conscious way from parents know exactly what that feeling of vichuneka is. The avas So when I'm looking at that child and loving that child, it's not potential. It's not because one day you're going to be functional and you're going to be a mother and you're going to love others. Of course, that's there too. That's when I see your eyes, when my eyes meet your eyes, I have no choice but to break out in a smile. It's like the joy of my life just came into my room, to the room. My burdens are gone. My anxiety is gone. The celebration of that relationship surpasses everything else. 
Now, paradoxically, this type of love actually is the deepest source for nourishing potential. Because when somebody feels that type of acceptance, it puts them in such a place of inner calmness, it allows them to feel their strength. It allows them to feel their potential. So even though we say, oh, it's unconditional, really it's this unconditional love that allows the Yivarechecha to come out in a yet deeper way. Because if it's always like, I'm giving this love to you because I know one day you won't disappoint me. The core of that child may remain very, very bruised, very wounded. It's the vichuneka that allows a person to feel their own inner, infinite light. I'm not just a means for an end. Just like Hashem. Hashem is not just a means for an end. You know, God is good because, you know, He got a lot of money, so we got to have a relationship with Him. That's a very, very superficial relationship. I'm going to invest in God because He creates the world, you know, so it's, it's a good bank to invest in. It's a good stock. I'm investing in this child because you have potential. But the chelik elekami mal in the child, the divinity, is not a means for an end. It is divine at its core. God's value is not because he accomplishes a lot of things, because he got his degree, because he got his smich, his dayonis, he finished shas, Hashem finished shas, it's emes. But that's not the core of the dignity of the child. So this type of love that is so graceful, matnas chinam, fuels much deeper development because you're celebrated at your course and now you can embrace yourself and suddenly you feel all your light, you feel your potential. I don't want to be a couch potato. Who doesn't want to succeed? (laughs) When you like yourself, when you love yourself, when you know yourself, I want to succeed. I want to bring out who I am. Who doesn't want to bring out who they are? That's that's the most organic, organic form of living. So this type of love doesn't come from the future. The awareness of your potential. I'm kissing my seven-year-old because he's going to be a real estate tycoon. Or he's going to be a genius. I'm hugging my four-year-old because he's going to be a gewaldike, gewaldike leader. Or a gewaldike, gewaldike ben That's all beautiful. But this is conditional. This type of love begins primarily after birth. Yivarecha Hashem v'yishmerecha begins with conception. This type of love begins primarily after birth. Mom or dad hold on to their child, look in their eyes, and their eyes meet for the first time. They touch their angelic cheeks, and the unconditional love is born and formed. And that's why the face is only introduced in the second verse. Yair Hashem, panov elecha. Why is there no face in the first pasuk? Excellent. In the womb, we don't see a face. Maybe you 3D technology. But that's a 3D type of face. This blessing is that you should experience the face, Yoyer Hashem Panov, the radiant countenance of the Reboiner Shalom. That's what you should see. You should feel the smile of Hashem when you start davening. A teenager asked me, he says, Judaism drives me crazy. I said, what drives you crazy? He said, Yala, you're shchidish. you forget Yala v'yavoy, you have to redo Shmenes. He says, come, I got through the first Shmenes, I'm already going crazy. And now I have to redo because I forgot Yala v'yavoy. Oh, I forgot Yala v'yavoy. He found it to be very oppressive and dogmatic and, and narrow. So I said, I'm going to give you a metaphor. He was an emotional young man and he had, uh, <laughs> you know, he, had, it, he was an emotionally sensitive person. I said, imagine one day, Bezham, you'll get married, you'll have a beautiful marriage, it's going to be your 25th wedding anniversary. But like it happens sometimes to men, it slips your mind. It slips, it could happen to a wife, it could happen to it slipped your mind, you're busy, whatever. It didn't slip your wife's mind. So she had, a, she ordered a limousine to pick you up from your office and to drive you to a restaurant. And she got the most beautiful restaurant in the city. And she prepared azoints and azalchas. She planned it two weeks before. And then afterwards, you're going to go on a cruise. All prepared in order to celebrate the anniversary. Anyway, a car pulls up, says, oh, you're going to a restaurant. You're like, okay, I'm hungry. And you go, you push her, forgot that it's the anniversary. And she's sitting and waiting. You could see she's waiting for something. You forgot. So you drink wine and you have a nice dinner and it's lovely and it's beautiful and you go out on a walk and you go on a cruise and it's gewaldic and there's music but not once did you mention 
the moment and the anniversary did you connect on that level? I ask him, what do you think about that? How is your wife going to feel? <laughs> he tells me disappointed. So I said, so how do you mend for that? How do you make amends? He says, I would tell her, I'm so sorry I forgot. Now I'm going to do it a second time and I'm going to do it right. So I said, Rish Chodesh is an anniversary. <laughs> the sun and the moon come back together. Hashem is very, very excited. <laughs> he prepares a whole grand, a whole grand feast on Rish Chodesh. You start davening and he's like with bated breath waiting for you to say happy anniversary. You forgot Yalav Yalav, okay. But understand, it means something. It means something. You're not doing Shmanesra again because we want to torture you. Because it means something. It means something. Your happy anniversary. This is, by the way, how you do it. This is how you speak to, speak to the spouse. I'm telling the men. Right? It, it means something. That's the gift. You should be able to experience this. In the womb, we don't see the face. The child doesn't see the face of mom. Mom doesn't see the face of the child. They can't gaze into each other's eyes. Not because she doesn't care. She's having mysterious nefesh for the child. But it's a different type. Certainly the father can't see the child and the child can't see him. But as the baby is born and the eyes connect, this begins Yoyer Hashem Ponovelecha. And this begins the Vichuneka. I want to say, somebody once sent me a clip a few years ago. It was very, very moving. There was a video somebody sent me. A fellow named uh, Derek Redmond. Derek Redmond is a British sprinter. And he ran in the Olympics. And he broke a record quite a few times. And he won a few gold medals. He was a really, really, really professional, athletic, and exceptional runner, sprinter. But something happened in the 1992 Olympic Games in Barcelona, in Spain. He finished last place in the semifinals in the 1992 Barcelona Games. And uh, this became his most famous moment. Not all of his victories, not all of his gold medals. What happened was he was off to a great beginning. He was running. He was confident in his victory. He seemed like to be the most skilled sprinter in the group. But midway through the race, he suddenly felt acute pain. And he knew that there's no way he was going to be able to continue. What happened was midway during the run, he tore his hamstring. And uh, it's painful. <laughs> if anybody ever experienced it. And he hit the floor with treme in tremendous agony and anguish. He was literally, it's like, you know, kidney stone. It's crazy, crazy pain. And uh, he was literally crying. He was literally, literally crying from pain. It was, it was just, it was horrible. So he's lying on the floor crying and he's watching the other people continuing the race and reaching the finish line. He was hoping to be the first one, and now he's just on the ground waiting for the emergency personnel to come and take him away. So everybody expected, you know, the ambulance is going to come, they're going to take a stretcher, they'll put him on the stretcher, and uh, they'll take him to the hospital, to the doctor, to help him out. Something happened, and it was remarkable. Instead of getting on the stretcher, he stood up, and he began limping limping to the finish line, but it was in excruciating pain. You could see it. The crowd rose to their feet and started to cheer him with such enthusiasm and passion. Literally, the standing ovation was astounding in its potency and its power and its appreciation. But then something happened. A man sitting in the crowd jumped onto the track. The security guards right away came to attack him, to move him away. This is tight security, Olympics. But this man pushed everybody. He was a big, strong guy. And he dashed towards Redmond, towards Derek. Security desperately tried to stop him. What is he about to do? Who knows what's going to be the next horror movie here? But he literally, he breached their blockades, he broke through them. He came up right behind Derek, the wounded sprinter, and he grabbed his arm. So Derek turned around to see who it was. It was his father. 
And his father hugged him and he literally helped him finish the race. People just stood and applauded and applauded to no end. I would say it was one of the finest moments of the Olympics because it brought out a moment that was deeper than what all the competition could bring out. He came in last place on that day. Not just last place, but way, way after all of the other sprinters. But I would say that he and his father scored another type of victory that day. A victory that you score not through winning a race, but that you score through the sense of attachment and a relationship that can't be substituted by anything else. And he prevailed in demonstrating not only the power of the human spirit, that he'll continue, but his father's connection to him and being there for him when he was limping, when he was wounded, to help him reach the goal that he wanted to reach. Let's now come and finish with the third one. So what's the third one? Yisa Hashem Panav Eilecha V'yasim Lecha Shalom. And I'm going to tell you that the third one can get a little hard. <laughs> very good, very good. You're a smart girl. You heard what she said, because the first are so easy. <laughs> Point well taken. <laughs> but the third is still harder. Harder, and yet, in a way, the most divine. All of them are divine, but this is the third, so this is the climax. This is the zenith. This is the finish line. And here, we have a new word. Yisa Hashem Panavelecha. Hashem has to lift up his face towards you. Why does he have to lift up his face? In the fr- second one, he didn't have to lift up his face. He shined his face on you. You came into the room and you see his face shining. In the third verse, he says to lift up his face. So Rashi notices this, of course. Rashi notices everything. <laughs> Nothing skips Rashi. And Rashi says two words. Yisa Hashem Panavelecha, Yichboish Kasai. May he deal or conquer his anger. Who's to go angry? Who's angry? We're talking about beautiful blessings. Why is anybody angry? Ah, that's why his face is down. If I'm angry at you and you come into the room, what do I do? I don't look. I say, hi, 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 how are you? It's not what I do, right? What do I do? <laughs> I look, I open up a book. Yeah, everybody checks their phone, right? You start che- that's when you check your phone. When do people check their phone? People check their phone other times too. I know that. But my, my, my face is down. It's downtrodden. Yisah Hashem, it's a blessing. Yisah Hashem Panavelecha. May He lift up His face and look at you. Wow, is this a downgrade from the second one? And the second one is like, let Him shine His face on you. Rashi says, Panim Soichakais, Suhuvais. Soichakais means smiling, quelling, radiating. It's like when, when, when you know, the, the, the biggest, the most beloved person you came into the room and you just, you, you can't even catch your breath from excitement. That's the second Pasuk. The third one, suddenly anger, resentment, frustration, rage, ire. There's probably another few adjectives, but we'll leave it at that. You're a writer, yeah? What do you use in your books? I-R-E, I-R-E, yeah? Ire, ire. Yisa Hashem, now I'm suddenly lifting up my face. And then v'yasim l'cha shalom, give you peace. This is a third type of love, and it's the third part of the manual for parenting. And again, I want to credit Rabbi David Foreman for sharing these valuable insights, which I'm basing today's class on, and developing with some other sources, but the nucleus is his. This is the most challenging form of love and affection. You have invested your child with a lot of compassion. You blessed them, and you protected them. You offered them blessing number one. That's big. You already get, you already win the Olympics for that in my book. Boom, you're done. Guinea's Book of World Records. You blessed them and you protected them. That's pretty powerful. You emulated God. You spent years bestowing chen, grace, unconditional love and affection and warmth upon your child. You gave them that second blessing. Yoyer Hashem Panavelecha Wow. <laughs> now you're like, somebody wrote to me, you're one, uh, you're next, next level. Does that make the, the teenagers have that now, yeah? You're next, next level, yeah? Is that like a new slang? 
Okay. Or you're one above next level. So as far as I'm concerned, you're Hashem Ponevelecha Vichoneki. You emulated Hashem with that. You're next, 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 next level. But apparently Hashem thinks we're capable of more. And even though sometimes I feel like I'm on the floor and I tore chas v'shalom, a hamstring or I tore something else and I'm in pain. But our Father in Heaven believes that I could still finish the race. And that means that there is so much more inside a parent and so much more inside a real educator. So in the third one we speak about Hashem's face too. The first one has no face. The second one has a shining face. The third one has a face, but in a different way. May he lift up his face towards you. You see, there are two ways in which my eyes meet the eyes of my child. There are two ways in which our faces meet. Vertical and horizontal. You know the difference? Vertical is, I'm the big mommy, I'm the big tati, and I look down at my cute little malach, who bottom line can do no wrong. I know they poured the orange juice on the new couch, I know that. I know they took out the vanilla ice cream when they were not supposed to because their system is filled with sugar, ad lev hashamayim, and it's already, the hyper activity is already out of hand. I know she's supposed to go to bed, didn't go to bed. I know all that. But at the end of the day, what can your four-year-old do wrong already? After everything said and done, it's three in the morning. He never went to sleep. He comes into your bed. And all you could do is, I am my cute malach. Mwah, 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 mwah. But how are you going to wake up tomorrow? Mommy, I won't. I'll go to Costco with you. Yes, you know it's not what you're supposed to do, but... So what? You'll spend the day together, you'll go to Rita's, you'll go to the pizza shop, you'll go to catch an e, you'll get some sushi, and you'll end it up with a beautiful Costco trip to store your home with food so that nobody starves till next Shavuos. Yorir Hashem Panavei Lecha is God's vertical connection. I shine my face upon you, my child, and it's the top-down love. It's the face that extends vertically downward. I gaze at my child vertically. And yes, I stand above. I'm older. I'm more mature. I'm in a different position of life. My child stands below. My child is defenseless, innocent, adorable, cute, angelic, even if not perfect. My child is immature, my child is a baby, and because of that, he or she is infinitely delicious. You remember that? You remember those years? Infinitely delicious. You want to eat them for breakfast and lunch and supper. Those cheeks are just, as they say, they're too, they're too cute even to look at. Of course, you love them to pieces. It's a top-down love. There's no conditions. There's no string attached. Like I said, you look at this little baby and what do you see? You see divinity. You see a chelik ma. You don't need conditions. There's something innate. And you know what? To be able to continue that in the younger years is not hard. And even if this child is a troublemaker and they got expelled from this program or this school or that school, they're still adorable. Let's face it. But we all know that life moves on. <laughs> and the little angel grows up. And suddenly he's taller than you. And suddenly he may be stronger than Tati. <laughs> and suddenly he's not anymore six. He's 18. He may be spending three hours a day in the gym. He may be building his muscles. He's not anymore that little child I could put on my shoulders. And say, come, you'll take a buddy. Tati will give you a buddy. Come, I'll go into bed with you and I'll tell you a beautiful story about Reb Chaim in the times of the Baal Shem Tov. And even if he's screaming and crying, I'll give him 20 kisses and reassure him how adorable he is and how much I love him and put him to bed and everybody will be happy. But this is not a child that anymore, if I promise him a Slurpee in 7-Eleven, they still do that. I also do it or an ice cream, or a milkshake, all is well. 
Now my angel is growing up. And you know what? He has his opinion about things. And she has her opinion about things. And they may be different than Tati's opinions. Or mommy's opinions. And suddenly when I look at this person, I'm not looking at them vertically anymore. I actually have to look up. <laughs> Maybe they're looking at me vertically. Or at least it's horizontally. Now I have to gaze at my child. And it may be harder. I may be tempted, because I'm nice, to avert my gaze. I don't want to be confrontational. Let me just avert my gaze. Let me go to my room. A father told me the other day, he says his father, his son comes home very late and he's having a lot of issues with him. But he says, but I'm a good guy, I don't want to fight. So what do I do? When I hear the door, I run up to my bedroom and I lock the door. And that way there's no fighting in the house. He doesn't want to look. If I don't look, I don't get upset. I go to my room, I go in, under my blanket with my book, whatever I do, whatever he does, I don't have to be confrontational. But the truth is that this father, although he means well, is making a mistake. Because what his son really needs when he comes home is that his father should look at him, not that his father shouldn't look at him. I understand his father. I'm not judging, trust me. I don't judge. I understand his father. But what a son needs is the father to stay down there and look him in his eyes. And that's what Rashi is telling us. Yisa Hashem Panavelecha. May God lift his face to you. Rashi says, may he conquer his anger. What does this mean? How does it come into Berchus Kayanam? This means that the face is downcast. My face may be experiencing anger. So I ask, I ask, Hashem, lift up your face. The Kayanim are giving a blessing. Let Hashem lift up your face. This is the blessing that they should experience. If this is what Hashem wants to do for the Jews, I want to do this for my children. I want to lift up my face. But why is my face downtrodden? My face was just smiling. I was shining. I was quelling. I was dancing. We were playing Monopoly together. We were having a baseball uh, game. We were throwing, passing bull. We were swimming. We were eating Slurpees together. Of course, you buy ice cream for the kids, but we know who enjoys it more. Because in parenting, this represents a very sensitive moment when the child actually becomes a distinct individual. Not only is he not in my womb anymore, but he's not anymore that little child who I feel I could control even in the most beautiful of ways. You see, as long as I feel like I have control, unconditional love is sometimes so geschmack, it's so beautiful. Because of course you love with all your heart, but you feel you know exactly what you're loving, you're loving the most delicious, holy, beautiful thing. But sometimes when the child becomes independent and they can choose like an adult, the way the ch father chooses, the way the mother chooses, suddenly when I become aware of my child's independence, and I know this is a sensitive line, it can become emotionally difficult for many parents. I know parents who have shared how difficult it is for them to stay so emotionally connected to their children when suddenly they feel that they don't have that ownership, that authority, even that connection. Suddenly I have to look at my child vertically, horizontally, not vertically. You're an equal, but you're not an equal. And what if I'm feeling that my child is making decisions that I don't approve of? So it's not just you're an equal, but fine, you're doing your thing and it's wonderful and it's lovely, but what if it's something that I don't like? Or it's something hurtful? So I can love to pieces my toddler, my baby, the little cute angel, but now I have to let go. Now it's a different type of love. It's a love that must come with a certain form of respect. That's a whole different creature. That's a whole different attitude. What do I do at such a moment? And this is a choice every parent has to make. Do I avert my eyes from my child in a display of disappointment and pain? Or do I gaze at my child even if there is pain? And even if there's something bothering me? If I keep my eyes, my eyes down, I don't look at you. What did I do just at that moment? I detached. And I sent a message of detachment. I don't want to be confrontational. I'm trying to be nice. I'm a good guy. But I really detached. And I understand I have no other way to deal with my pain and disappointment. So I look away. 
Maybe I'm being passive aggressive, trying to scare him into remaining an extension of me. Maybe I'm just despairing. Maybe I just can't deal with it. I get it. But the third verse of the priestly blessing says, I may be capable of much more, no matter whatever choices my child makes at that moment. I will never, ever take my eyes off him or off her. I will remain forever connected. I will not let go of my child. And the truth is, it's at this moment that the child needs the parent most. It's at this moment that they so need the attachment of the child. And we know letting go and still being connected is hard. If I don't have to let go and I could be connected, it's great. I hold on to you. I control you. I never let go. I look at you and I don't stop looking at you. But to look at you while I let go is difficult because it's creating space but not running away because of my pain and disappointment. It's watching my child barking up the wrong tree. And I may not be able to fix it at the moment. I may not have a way to repair it. He may be experimenting with his youth in a way that's driving me mad. He or she may have experienced trauma that is causing them to make ill-fated decisions. He or she may experience or have experienced consciously or unconsciously some stuff that I know about or I don't know about that may be causing behavior that is difficult, that is painful, that is challenging. He may even come across sometimes as rude or insensitive or obnoxious or just clueless or weird. It may be embarrassing for me, for neighbors or even for my parents or for siblings or aunts or uncles or grandparents or relatives. It may be very difficult. And the first thing I want to do is almost like associate with them and say, I, I, I don't know about him, I don't know. It's almost I sometimes want to side with the one that makes me feel comfortable. But your aunt doesn't need you. Your child needs you. Your mother doesn't need you at this point. Baruch Hashem. She may need you in other ways. Your child needs you. My neighbor doesn't need me. My child, trust me, needs me. And the child who had this trauma and has this trauma needs you much, much, much more. But here's the real catch. It's exactly the opposite. If I want my child to find peace, I want my child to heal, I want my child to really be able to discover his or her true calling, his or her true light, what's going to help them bring, come to that place? Father and mother averting their gaze or father and mother coming closer to them? It's precisely if I really care about this child and their future, I want to remain close. Anger, disappointment are all normal things. We get it. But what, who am I really thinking about? I'm thinking about my pain. You're disappointing me. You didn't give me nachas. You're giving me a headache, which is true. I'm angry. I'm disappointed. But if I can go into a deeper place and say, was that vichuneka really real, even when I'm angry? Or it was only real when they were two years old and they couldn't really get me angry because what's the worst thing they can do? Make the couch dirty. What, am I going to kill them? But now when they're 17 or they're 25 or they're 35 or they're 22 or they're 16 or whatever the situation is, was that vichuneka really real? If I want my child to heal, they need to find peace. And if they need to find peace... The greatest person who can help them reach that is not a therapist and not any rabbi in the world. It's Tati Imami. I want to hold them closer to me, not further. I want to never avert my eyes. I never want to allow anything to cause me to sever the cords between me and my child, between us and our children. Sometimes it's hard because my child may be telling me, I'm not interested in you, Tati. Mommy. You were a mommy enough. I'm done. I have other people in my life now. I need space. And it's hard. We want to reciprocate. You need space for me? Should I tell you how much space I need from you? I need more space from you than you need from me because you're eating off my refrigerator two in the morning and you're emptying out my freezer four in the morning. And you're living in my house rent-free. You know, these are all emotions that are very normal and, and parents have them sometimes with their children. So I want to reciprocate almost that lack of interest. You're giving me an attitude? I'll give you an attitude. 
But we have to remember something. It's hard. But if a child is broken and I suddenly take that attitude and make it personal and I reciprocate, what am I doing? All I'm doing is I'm distancing my child from having the ability to be able to find their own inner light and love and value. But what if I could lift my face? Rashi says, conquer my anger. Conquer anger doesn't mean suppress it and repress it and deny it. Conquer doesn't mean that. When I conquer a city, it doesn't mean I deny that city. It means it belongs to me. Conquer anger means your anger belongs to you. You don't belong to it. That's very, very important. I may be angry. I may be frustrated. I may want to scream, get yourself another house. Grosser, grosser, chachem. But I own it. I know where it's coming from. It's coming from the fact that there's a lot of pain. There's a lot of disappointment. A lot of work. A lot of my own pain being triggered. Maybe a lot of concern. But I own it. And because I own it, I ask myself, what's really bothering you? What's bothering you is that it's your child. You love this child. So now I, make an, I ask another question. What should I say now or do now that will bring me closer to the child, my child? Do I want to become closer? Do I want to become more distant? Do I want my child to feel closer to their parents or more distant? Is it better for the child or worse for the child to feel that they have a mother who's there for them constantly? And then I conquer it and I lift up my face and I look you in the eyes and I say, I'm here. He naini, I am here. And I will never leave. I am here. And you know what happens? We give our children peace. The gift of peace is an incredible gift. Peace is not something that anybody knows. Peace is something that only you know about your life. Nobody can know it. Nobody can guess it. People look peaceful, but they have a war inside of them. Tolstoy wrote that book, War and Peace? Huh? He wasn't talking about the war between Napoleon and, and, and the Tsar. He was talking about war and peace inside. The plot is the war and peace. The war and peace inside is very, very heavy. It's very, very deep. And when I'm experiencing that type of war, nobody may know it, but I may know it. So unconditional love doesn't mean uncritical love. I may disagree. I may feel there's some serious mistakes being made. I may feel a person is lost, but I may say what they need and what I want to do now is connect to them more and not less. V'yasim l'chashalim, can I give my child peace? Remember, as much as you're struggling, your child is struggling probably even more. People don't realize that. Mother comes to me, I'm struggling so much with my child. And I ask them, do you know how much your child is struggling? I never thought about that. But I have to know that. Is my child also struggling or I'm the only one struggling? They're struggling even more. Do I know what's going on in their heart? Am I attentive to what's happening in their life? What happens when they wake up in the morning and when they can't sleep at night? Can I give them the feeling of peace which can only come when I remain present? And I say, when I see you, I feel peace. And I want you to feel peace. Shalom from the word shlemos. There's a perfection just from being in your presence and connecting to you because I could see your divinity and godliness and holiness right now, even if your survival mechanisms may be things that I wish were different. What gives you strength to do this? The answer, of course, is the past and even the present. You have given your child, a blessing and protection. You smiled at them in the light. There's so much love and wellsprings of love that we can both draw from. I could remember all the good times. I could remember who this girl was at one and two and three and four and five. I could remember who this boy was. I know their wisdom and depth and spirituality and holiness and radiance. I know their kindness and sensitivity. At 17, they didn't suddenly become Nazis. Chas v'shalom. I could draw from all that and now I could give the final gift, the gift of peace. The greatest gift that a parent can give. And it also comes from the present of never ever being lured into the facade and always retaining the connection with the core of the child. 
I have to say one thing. I went a few days ago to be Menachem Avel, my neighbor, Aviva Yurowitz. She lost her father. He was 95 years old. His sandik, he was born in 1927 in New York. His sandik was Reb Baruch Ber, Leibovitz, the Birch Hashmuel, who came to fundraise in America for the Kamenetzi Yeshiva. So he was 95. He passed away a few days ago. Reb Jack Finkel, Reb Yankel Finkel. And she tells me, I just want to say one thing. Never, ever in my life did my father ever make me feel that I disappointed him. And she said, sometimes my friends say, you know, our parents ask for something and we really can't do it. You know, the shvuas have a house filled with... And, and you explain, but ultimately you feel a little guilty. He says, there's nothing my father ever said or expected that ever made me feel guilty in my relationship to him. He says, he dies and I feel so much peace in our connection. I thought that was quite remarkable. So now let's bring it full circle. You remember what we didn't we, we didn't finish with? Oh, this is a long class, huh? Now you'll see the connection with Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov, and it becomes very clear. Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov each embodied one of these three verses. So the Medrash says, "Did we get Kaisav Aruchu from Avram from Yitzhak or Yaakov?" What was Avram's power? Koyiz Arecha. He didn't think he can have children. He didn't think there's a potential for a future. Hashem said, go count the stars. You can't count the stars. <laughs> you won't be able to count your children. You will have so many children and they will be so blessed and successful like the stars in the heaven. They will be abundant. They will be eternal. They will be indestructible. And this is what Avram does. This is what Avram represents. The belief in the potential of our children, physical, spiritual, emotional, ad infinitum till the heavens. And the Pasik says, Hashem says, I love Avram Avinu ki yedativ l'mana she yitzavah es bonav es beisei v'shamru derech Hashem lasa tzedakah o mishpat. He gives it over to his children. He teaches them how to live a life of tzedakah, of charity, of justice. Avram Avinu ko yi izarecha teaches us to teach our children to aim for the stars. As a father once told his son, I don't care if you aim high and miss. I'm afraid if you aim low and you never miss. Avram is the great believer in humanity and the great believer, Hashem teaches him, you're not barren. You and Sarah are not infertile. There's going to be a future. This is the source of the first blessing of Berchus Kayim, to be able to believe and see the potential in every child to continue to grow and reach tremendous heights because that's what every child is, this unbelievable potential. And to be able to help them grow and bless them like Avram Avinu is told, the whole world will be blessed by you. He saw the potential and he helped everybody grow. Even Three nomads who had nowhere to eat were welcomed by him and he turned them suddenly. He revealed their spiritual potential. What was Yitzchak's of inner uniqueness? His uniqueness. Unconditional love. He loved Esav. Why did he love Esav? You know what the answer is? Because that's what fathers do. Because a father loves a child unconditionally. But he's Esav. Yitzchak was naive. He wasn't naive. How do you know he wasn't naive? says clearly, Rashi says, he knew that Yaakov mentions Hashem, Esav doesn't, he knew the women Esav married, and they were Meiris Ruach, Yitzhak was upset, but he never stopped loving Esav. Vichuneka, because love may be, I may disagree, there may be an element of pain, but a father loves his children unconditionally. Vayev, Yitzhak has Esav. That's the second element of Berches Kayanim. Vani v'anar neil cha'at koi. Not only that, the Gemara says in Shabbos, Hashem is going to tell Yitzchak, your children sinned. And Yitzchak is going to say, what, they're my kids and not your kids. <laughs> and then he's going to split it with God. And it says in far, Yitzchak is going to be the one to tell Hashem, I also have a child who was not uh, such a tzatzke. So what, I'd stopped loving him? I loved him. And not only that, he always felt safe with me and he always wanted to be with me. And none of that, Rivka, when she had to separate the two brothers, who did she send away? She sent Yaakov away. She didn't send Esau. And in that story, the Pesach says, Aim Yaakov and Esau. At the end of Tosav, she says, I don't know why it says that she's the mother of Yaakov and Esau suddenly. Because she's the mother of Esau too. At the moment of truth, she sent Yaakov away because she knew Yaakov will be all right without his father. Esau needs his father. 
And at the moment of the Akeda, Yitzchak was transformed. He became a carbon. He was never the same person. He became a father who was gifted with the divine gift of unconditional love. That's why he could love Esav that way. And then you have Yaakov. And what was Yaakov's uniqueness? Mitasei Shlema. His entire family remained wholesome. It wasn't a simple thing. Avram's child left, Yishmal. Yitzchak's child, Esav, doesn't remain an ear to the legacy of Yitzchak, even though he loved him. Yaakov somehow managed that every one of his children became a father of the Jewish people. How did he do it? Mitasei Shlema. And the answer is, Yisa Hashem Panavelecha, the third one. He never averted his eyes. Reuven did something that could have severed him from the family. He interfered into his father's very private life, the Pasuk says in Vayishlach. Rashi says in the beginning of Dvarim that Yaakov did not rebuke him until his death. Yaakov was quiet about the story of Reuven and Bila for 60 years. Do you understand? Imagine your son does something pretty heavy, pretty negative, and you don't say a word for 60 years. Rashi says, why? Because Reuven said, if I mention it earlier, he's going to abandon me and go to Esau. So he was quiet until his death. Rashi, the beginning of Parshas Dvarim. Shimon and Levi did something that Yaakov really didn't approve of. The whole story of Shechem. And then there was the sale of Yosef, which Yaakov could have suspected easily. And then there was Yosef himself, who the brothers felt was the black sheep in the family. But Yaakov never averted his gaze from any child. So ultimately, they all felt they belonged. They all felt they were attached. And ultimately, Mitasei Shlema, every one of his children, identified as the child of Yaakov and Yitzchak and Avram and became the father of the 12 Shvatim, of one of the 12 Shvatim, which fathered the Jewish people. This was Yaakov's uniqueness. So the Medrash says, where did we get Berchus Kayanim from? And we have the three opinions. Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Nechemi, the Rabbanon. Avram, koi yezarecha, koi sevaruchu. Yitzchak, neil ad koi, koi sevaruchu. Yaakov, koi soimar lebeis Yaakov. Which is the moment of Matan Torah. Which included all the 12 tribes. Koi soimar lebeis Yaakov. Koi sevaruchu, this was Yaakov. So here we have the manual. Simple and profound. For raising children. Judaism's guide to parenting. Number one, bless them and protect them. Number two, shine your face at them and give them grace and unconditional love. Number three, lift up your face and gaze at them and give them the gift of peace. We can give this to our children when we can give it to ourselves. Do you know how to bless yourself and protect yourself? Do you know how to shine your face on yourself and give yourself grace, and see God's face shining on you, and giving you grace. Do you know how to feel God lifting up his face, and looking at you, looking at me, with my failures, with my disappointments, and giving me peace? When I experienced the Ani Avarachim, the blessing, I could pass on that blessing to my loved ones. Have a beautiful week, and a wonderful week. Next week, we have the regular class, 9.30 on Tuesday. Thank you, everybody is invited. It says in Parsha Shmini that Aaron finished Avoid and he blessed the Jewish people. So Rashi says it was Birchis Kainim, but Hashem never commanded him. So later Hashem says, That's how you should bless the Jewish people. The way Aaron did it, spontaneously. Because he loved them. He didn't have to tell him to bless them. Spontaneously. Beautiful. Rabbi Friedman from Betar. Yeah. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.